is from the book of Exodus. Now we're going to turn to the New Testament, to the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 12. So Exodus chapter um, 20, and um, we're picking up our series on Christian ethics, taking a look at uh, Christian ethics based upon the standard known as the Ten Commandments. We're looking at the, the Fourth Commandment, and um, that is in connection then, this Fourth Commandment, with the Ten Commandments that we read earlier um, today, but I want to draw your attention just to the Fourth Commandment. So Exodus chapter 20, verse 8 and following, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant or your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. All right, now I want to draw your attention to Matthew chapter 12, where we also have the teaching of Jesus regarding the Sabbath. So Matthew chapter 12, verse 1, at that time Jesus went through the cornfields on the Sabbath. And his disciples were hungry, and they began to pluck ears of corn to eat. But when the Pharisees saw it, they said to him, Look, your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. And he said to them, Have you not read what David did when he was hungry and those who were with him, how he entered the house of God and ate the bread of the presence, which was not lawful for him to eat, nor for those who were with him, but only for the priests? Or have you not read in the law how the, on the Sabbath the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are guiltless? I'll tell you, something greater than the temple is here. And if you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. For the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. So a lot could be said about Sabbath, so we can only touch on a few things in regard to that. Uh, what I want to do is want to draw your attention now to uh, the Heidelberg Catechism, one of the confessional documents of the church. The purpose of catechism and confession of the church is to summarize certain teachings for us. So I want to draw your attention to that now. Uh, you'll notice that there's a question there. And then um, let's, uh, given that this is a confession that belongs to the church, to us, we're going to confess the answer together. So here's the question. What does God require in the fourth commandment? Let's say this together. First, that the ministry of the gospel and the schools be maintained, and that especially on the day of rest, I diligently attend the Church of God to hear God's Word, to use the sacraments, to call publicly upon the Lord, and to give Christian offerings for the poor. Second, that all the days of my life I rest from my evil works. Let the Lord work in me through His Spirit, and so begin in this life the eternal Sabbath. This is a, that's actually a, a wonderfully uh, put question and answer, and it kind of simplifies things for us on how we are to view this day. Because I find in Christian circles, and maybe you find this as well, we get caught up into what we call casuistry regarding this day. You know, the idea of, you know, what may we do and what should we be doing and, and that kind of thing. And then you get all these disagreements within the church to the extent where we actually lose sight of the fundamental focus and the teachings of Jesus regarding the Sabbath and how Jesus has reserved this day for us to be not a day of bickering, but a day of delight and blessing and rest and uh, worship. So we're going to be looking at the Sabbath. The Hebrew word Shabbat means simply rest. Literally, it means cessation, ceasing from work. Because remember, the fourth commandment, I don't know if you thought about this, but the fourth commandment is just as so much uh, a commandment about work as it is about rest, right? Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days, there's a command, six days you shall labor and do all your work. And the Bible says elsewhere, if a man does not work, neither let him eat. So we're called to work. Not called to sit home, collect a check, you know, unless, you know, we're on disability or going through something in our lives. But if we are, if we have the ability to work, we should work. But there's also one day in seven we're allowed to rest. What a gift of God, right? And what a blessing it is that we can gather on the day and just do something different. You know, you can't see it. You're looking at me, but I get to see what's going on outside, right? And I see traffic, and I see cars, people doing their business. And I think it's such a wonderful thing just to, as a gift of God, just to come here and just rest together and worship together and be together. Now, um, A.V., will you go back? Would you go back to the beginning there? I want you to take a look at that. 
I want to skip the first couple of lines about the fourth commandment, and I want you to notice after the answer is given, one, two, three, four lines down, notice what this day is called. It's called a day of rest. A day of rest. Um, who can tell me what the original language of the Heidelberg Catechism is? Anybody? You can talk. You must know. Somebody. German. It's not Dutch, all right? It's German. It's not Mandarin. It's not anything, right? It's, it's, it's German. Okay? Now, I want you to look at that where it says here, where it talks about this day. The thing that it says about this day is that this is a day of rest. The German word for this day, here's a little instruction here. The German word is just one word, Feiertag or fear talk, which literally means holiday or holy day. And the fundamental concept of holy or holiness means set apart. So this is a day that is a special day that is designed by God to be set apart by God's people for a special purpose. And as we're going to see, it's for rest and worship and physical and spiritual refreshment, okay? So, holiday, holy day. That's the, the main meaning of these four words, the day of rest, just one word in a German, okay? Now, there are certain trans English translations of this, as we see here, that interpret the German word as day of rest. However, given that some of us, not all of us, but some of us come from a history of our church that is largely of Dutch background, you will find some translations. In fact, I think it may be the case, yeah, they have, they have here what is called the, the Gray Hymnal. And this is a hymnal that the Christian Reformed Church uh, uses. And if you look at the translation that's used in this book here, it speaks about the Heidelberg Catechism, if I'm not mistaken, not as just the day of rest, but festive day of rest. They add the word festive. Why? Probably drawing upon Isaiah 58, where it says that the Sabbath day is to be a day of delight among God's people. So if we go with that translation, festive day of rest, the word festive connotes or carries with it two ideas. One is that this day is not to be a day of heaviness and drudgery, but it is to be a day of delight. It is to be a day of rejoicing. I mean, the, the psalmist says that, right? He says, this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. So this is to be a day of joy, not drudgery, not long faces, but joy, a blessing. Festive, a festive day. So, a delightful, festive day, but the word festive also carries with it not only the connotation of delight, but also of, and this may seem strange to you, but of activity. And you go, wait a minute, I thought we were supposed to rest on this day. Yeah, we're supposed to rest on this day, but that doesn't mean, resting does not necessarily mean just kind of sitting down and staring at a wall all day and making sure, you know, as long as I don't exercise too much, or if I don't walk too much, or, you know, whatever, right? This is the day to be a day of, yes, physical and spiritual rest, but it's also to be a day of activity, a day of activity, especially in connection with what we're doing right now, which is worship. Do you think of worship in the way that the Bible does? Not as a, not as a time of passivity, but as a time where you're active. Why do I say that? Take a look here, and notice, notice the verbs that are used here in the last five lines. On this day of rest, what do we do? Are we to be passive? No, we're to be active. I diligently attend the church of God. When I come here, I come here to hear God's word. I come here to use or participate in the sacraments. I come here to call publicly upon the Lord. I come to give Christian offerings for the poor. One theologian once said this about worship. He said, worship is a verb. It's activity. It's not passivity. You don't come here just to sit, but to engage the Lord in active worship. That's biblical worship, holistic worship. Now, why do we take time to bring that out? Because I think 
that what this way that I explained the Lord's Day is not only faithful to the catechism, but it's also faithful to the teachings of Jesus. Now, if you put Matthew chapter 12 on there for us, please. I want to draw your attention. I want to work through this passage with you here as we look at Jesus' teaching regarding the Sabbath. It says, at the time, Jesus went through the cornfields on the Sabbath. Now, you may have a translation of the Bible that doesn't say cornfields because this is kind of a difficult word to translate. You might have wheat fields or barley fields. But it says here, cornfields on the Sabbath. Disciples were hungry, and they began to pluck the ears of corn, or some translations have it, they, came, they, they started to pluck the heads of grain, if it's wheat or it's barley. And they began to eat it. But I want you to notice something. When the Pharisees saw this, they said to him, look, your disciples are doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath. And, and our, your, your, our first reaction is like, these Pharisees are really tight guys. I mean, really, you're just, somehow you're just picking these heads of grain and you're eating them and they're saying you're violating the Sabbath. Why would they say that? Because the Pharisees believed that, the, that, that, that this eating of the heads of grain was just actually uh, a form of harvesting. And they said, you shouldn't be harvesting on the Sabbath. That is working, you know. And so they condemned the Pharisees. And what do they say? They're, not, they're doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. And we ask, is that really true? Now, when it says here that the Pharisees said, you're, you're doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath, we're, we're, the question we have to ask ourselves is, what standard are they working with? Because if you take a look at the Bible as a whole, even if you look at the Old Testament, it does not get very legislative regarding how we're to observe this day. It just doesn't. But you know what the Pharisees did? What the Pharisees did is they tried to build a fence for people around the Sabbath so that they could keep the Sabbath because at the time of Jesus, the Jews were breaking covenant with God and they were turning their backs on God and then the Pharisees thought of themselves as a reform movement within Judaism. So we got to get our people back to the Sabbath. So what did they do? They actually went beyond the Bible and they devised a number of rules and regulations known as the traditions of the elders or of the rabbis that were rules and regulations that were applied to the people so that they could be helped in maintaining the sanctity or the holiness of the Sabbath. Do you know how many rules they put together? 1,500. Now, in a sense, when Archie got up and he was talking about, you know, all of what we may do here and what we should not be doing, I mean, that just goes with taking on a church. But you know, if, if, you, if you ever, I don't know if it was emailed out to you, I, I got it, where it's like, there's like a list of three and a half or four pages about, you know, how we're supposed to use this room and that room, and, and that, that's all fine. But after a while, you look at this like, boy, I don't know, how, how am I going to keep all these regulations in my head, you know? That's the way it was. That's the way it was. Now, I'm not, I'm not saying it's a bad thing. But when you have so many rules and you have so many regulations, it takes time for you to try to figure them all out and, and, and remember them. Well, can you imagine 1,500? The people are saying to themselves, how in the world am I going to remember these? And how am I going to keep all these rules and regulations? So what the Pharisees thought were good for the people, eh, not so good. It actually became a huge weight on their shoulders. And Jesus says, no, 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 this is not the original design of the Sabbath, huh? Well, these disciples are doing what was not lawful according to the traditions of the elders. So what Jesus says to them is this. He says, you know what? You've got all these rules. You know what conservatives sometimes do, Jesus is saying? They develop all these rules and regulations, and then there has to be strict compliance with these rules and regulations. No exceptions. Jesus says, you know what? There are exceptions on the Sabbath. He goes on to say, have you not read what David did when he was hungry and those who were with him? How he entered the house of God and ate the bread of presence, which was not lawful for to eat, him to eat, nor with those, but only for the priests. Here was a law in the books. This is a table of showbread. Disciples were not to eat, or um, people were not to eat at the table of showbread. Only the priests were supposed to eat it. But here's David running from King Saul. He's hungry. And so as an act of mercy and necessity, the priests actually gave him the bread to eat. He says, sometimes you have these, these laws of compliance. But sometimes there are exceptions to the rule. This is one of them. These are called works of mercy and necessity. Jesus goes on to give one other exception. He says, verse 5, Have you not read in the law how the Sabbath, on the Sabbath the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are guiltless? Okay. So we're called to rest on this day. A glorious rest. But do you see me resting right now? 
I mean, the priests in the temple, that was, their, that, that, was, that was a busy work, and they would have to do the work on the Sabbath day. What am I doing on the Sabbath day? What am I doing on this day? Preaching, leading worship, doing all kinds of stuff. Am I breaking the Sabbath? Jesus is saying no. So there are works of necessity, and there are works of mercy, and there's works of what we call piety or religion. The point is that Jesus provides greater latitude for the Sabbath than the Pharisees. I think sometimes we have to find, maybe some of us have experienced this, that when you read your Bible, Jesus all, it provides more freedom on this day, maybe than what you grew up with. Look at the final thing for the sake of time. Jesus says in verse 8, the last thing he says here, he says, for the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. What is he saying there? Can I tell you what he's saying? He's saying this. It's going to sound rather crap. And Jesus is saying, when it comes to the Sabbath and how we view the Sabbath, I'm boss of the Sabbath. I'm boss of the Sabbath. I give the proper meaning to the Sabbath. As the Son of God, I give proper application of the Sabbath. And I bring the Sabbath back to its original intent, back to its original design. What is the original design of God on this day? is that this day is to be a day not of drudgery, not first and foremost rules and regulations, but this day is to be a day of rest and worship and physical and spiritual refreshment. Do you notice that that is really the emphasis of, of the catechism? Can you go back to Heidelberg Catechism? Right there, good, perfect. Notice, second, on this day, that all the days of my life I rest from my evil works. Let the Lord work in me through his spirit. And so begin in this life the eternal Sabbath rest. This day points ultimately to the rest that you and I have in Christ. We rest from the guilt of sin, the power of sin, and the penalty of sin. We are to rest from sin all the days of our life. But you know what the Lord does on that for us on this day? He allows us in a special way to get away from all the distractions and the noise of life that so easily lead us away from God, from Jesus, and fall into various sins. And he says, on this day, I give you this day to come into my presence. And I give you this day to be refreshed by my spirit. And when I give you that on this day, you know what you get? You know what I get? We get a, te we get a, a, a taste of what the Bible calls the eternal Sabbath rest, where one day, you know what? We get to leave this earth, and we get to move on into heaven, eventually in the new creation. We won't have to struggle with sin, and we won't have to struggle with the effects of sin anymore. Crying, mourning, pain, death, all these things will be done away with, for we will be in glory with our Lord, beholding Him face to face. Should I tell you why this day is so important? The Lord says, I set apart this day to take what is over here and what's in store for you, and I'm bringing it down to this earth right now so that what we experience here below in our worship and on this special day is just a beautiful foretaste of the kind of rest and worship and beauty that we will experience one day in heaven. Now, that's a positive way of looking at the Lord's day, isn't it? And that's the kind of attitude that we are have to have together. So really, you know what the Lord is saying? He's saying this day is like a spiritual oasis for you. We're in the wilderness of life. We're in the desert of life and the commotion of life and the movement of life. And he says, I allow you to come together, especially on this special day, to, to, take, to, to bend down and, and drink of that oasis. The question is, Are we willing to carve out a Sabbath? And are, really, are we willing to take the time to bend over and drink from this oasis? Bend down and drink. That takes self-discipline, doesn't it? It does. But we need it. Um, can you put on the quote from a man named Dallas Willard there? Did I give that to you? Oh. I'm sorry. My bad, as they say. Listen to this. He says, the Sabbath offers us the very necessary time to simply do nothing. It reminds us that we don't have to do in order to be. It allows us to break the power of busyness and distraction and in the end helps us not only to find ourselves, but opens the way to God to find us in new ways. It allows the reality of God to stand in the midst of our lives and the wind of eternity to blow in our faces. 
Not for nothing does the psalmist say, be still and know that I am God. It's a beautiful quote by Dallas Willard. He's saying, listen, the other six days that we, that we work and we live life, busy, 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 distracted, distracted, distracted. On this day, you know what the Lord does? He cups, he cups our heads and our faces in our hand, in his hands. And he says, look at me. Look at me. You know, for those of us who are parents, remember that when our, when our kids are born, how light they are, how small they are, and we just cup them in our arms and our hands. And what do we do? We look at them and go, come here, baby. Look at me. And that baby just focuses in on you. That's, that's who we are in, in the palms of God's hands. Just look at me. Look at me. Kind of like what Mary did. Remember Mary and Martha, where Mary just took the time to look into the face of Jesus and sit at his feet? Martha's busy in the kitchen getting everything ready. You know, Jesus coming over, going to exercise hospitality. And what does Jesus say to Martha? Martha, Martha, you're so busy with so many things. You're so distracted with so many things. But Mary has chosen the better thing. In other words, she's sitting here and she's paying attention to me. She's being absorbed in me. And you know what? That's what we do the six days of the week. Six days of the week, we're like Martha in the kitchen. Busy, busy, busy. Distracted, distracted, distracted. But Jesus says, on this day... I'm allowing you to sit at my feet, spend the necessary time that you need to be with me. That you may grow in joy and in delight and in soul formation. What a beautiful thing that is. So let's remember that regarding this day. And let's have a positive view of this day. What is this day for? My friends, this day is a day for rest. It is a day of worship. It is a day of soul satisfaction. It is a day of soul formation. It is a day when we have the opportunity in a world that is so busy to invite others into this place to experience some of the blessings and delights that we get together in community and worship. And this is a day where the Lord breaks down from heaven to us, as it were, and he spoon feeds us some of these little tastes of the eternal Sabbath rest to come. That's a healthy view of the Lord's Day, and that's how we're going to enjoy this day together. Now, some of this may be inspiring in you with some questions, and we're going to deal with that in just a moment. But before we do, let's stand and let's sing together, Guide Me, O My Great Redeemer, and then we'll have a little discussion.